I'd like to thank Dave Shirley for um, joining us for um, being a guest presenter today. So Dave is an environmental scientist with over 20 years of experience working in the water and agricultural services. Uh, Dave has previously, previously worked with the University of Melbourne, uh, researching on pollutants and stress upon aquatic uh, environments and populations, uh, and is the founder of the Bio2 Lab, uh, which he founded in 2017 with Steve Marshall. Uh, and their business uh, develops and offers uh, offers novel water quality monitoring tools to the water industry. And today, Dave is going to be chatting to us about uh, a project that he's been working on in collaboration with the Werribee River Keeper. Um, and so I might kick it straight over to you, Dave. Okay, well, thanks um, for that. And yeah, so first, first of all, um, hi, everyone. And uh, thanks for, for, for kind of coming along today to have a, a listen to this uh, talk. Uh, I'd like to thank Melbourne Water for inviting me here today. Um, I hope you get a lot from it and um, yeah, ha happy to, to talk to anyone afterwards um, after, after the uh, talk with anything specific. So yeah, again, as Richard pointed out, this was a, a um, this um, project is, <clears throat> was a project we did with the Werribee River Association. Um, just uh, um, <clears throat> a bit about about me. Uh, firstly, though, um, I'm science director at Bio Two Lab. I used to um, work at the Melbourne Uni uh, identifying chemicals of concern impacting waterways, and did my PhD quite a few years ago um, in the viticulture sector, looking at biological indicators. So this was a project funded through the Port Phillip Bay Fund um, and it, 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 it um, has run from 2018 to, to 2020 so we're just finishing up now and it's called Bridging Troubled Waters and the main aim is to reduce threats to the health of Port Phillip Bay and that's through identifying sources and impacts of pollution in the Werribee catchment. I'd like to thank our project partners, the Werribee River Association and the Werribee River Keeper, um, John and Delp for funding the project. I'd like to thank Steve, uh, Teresa McIntosh and John Foster. Um, it's, it's been an excellent project and we've had Lots of fun to doing it. So the the, the main um, reason for doing it was to address some of the urban actions as part of the better bays and waterways um, uh, strategy. And one of those was to identify chronic fecal and or toxic pollution in hotspots and identify priority catchments. And I suppose also to increase collaboration with, between agencies to, to identify urban and rural actions. So the project had a number of components and I'll just run through them now. So there was a sediment quality monitoring program, there was a stormwater pollution profiling we did some biologic, bio, biological monitoring. We used drones and community um, volunteers to uh, map litter hotspots throughout the catchment. And m most importantly, we wanted to use all this information to increase education and awareness about the pollution issues affecting not only the Werribee, river and the associated creeks but also in general how urban environments can um, can can cause um, impacts to our our local waterways so the topics today is going to be what is what is stormwater pollution how does urban um, how does the urban sprawl impact our local waterways, so how does population in 
increases that are happening all the time impact the health of our waterways? How do you measure the impact of, of stormwater pollution using using sediment in the um in the waterways? Biological monitoring as a tool to assess how how healthy these um all these systems all these systems are. And then how do you find major sources of pollution? And um, linking all this data, all this scientific data that we are collecting to education and awareness outcomes. And I suppose at the end, we'd like to talk a, a few things about simple solutions that we, that we, we all can do to, to um, reduce our pollution. So what is uh, what is uh, stormwater? Well, it's basically rain rainwater that falls on roads, roofs, anything that, that is hard and is then carried away to our local waters through drains that you'll find out at the front of your house or, or business. And basically that is uh, that is stormwater. But what is stormwater pollution? Well, it's basically, again, all that water traveling over these hard surfaces and then picking up various types of, of pollutants as it's traveling over roads, um, picking up hydrocarbons off the road, picking up heavy metals. It's even um, when someone puts, you know, dumps some, some um, some some waste into the stormwater drain and as you can see in this uh photo here i'll just uh yeah as you can see in this photo here this is a good example of industrial pollution where you'll see in the gutter that there's a whole lot of mess um <laughs> whole lot of pollution sitting there but that will end up in our in our waterways. <clears throat> so, what are some of these? What are some of these pollutants? Well, they there are there are lots lots of them. Um, sediment just entering our waterways, hydrocarbons, oils, heavy metals, pesticides. There's a whole range of of um, I suppose pollutants that that we use every day um, that end up in our waterways if we're not careful. So a bit about impervious area and these are the hard surfaces I just talked about earlier and they're the, the, um, the one of the biggest factors with urbanization is the is the high impervious areas that that's that start to appear um, in our in our commercial, even residential areas. And mainly it's, it's because as as these hard impervious areas increase, you get high vo volumes of, of water going down these drains during, during rain events. Um, so basically you'll, you'll get a situation where you'll get high vo volumes of, of, of of rain going down in high impervious areas like the, the top f f photo, whereas in the bottom photo, you can see that there's a lot more open space, green space, not not many roads, there's a bit of a, a, a wetland. <clears throat> and what this does, this, this will allow the water to filter through before it, it, it gets into our waterways. So it actually acts as a bit of a, a natural filter. <clears throat> but moving on to to land to land use um, and pollution generation. So we know that different land land uses can generate different pollution profiles. So a hard surface is not a hard surface. If hard surfaces can be different, it just 
depends on the actual land use that that hard surface is is um is in. So industrial areas, commercial areas, residential areas, these all have different pollution profiles. Um, and it's important to match the stormwater management strategies to these pollution profiles. So if you have a look at the, the Werribee catchment, you'll be able to see up in the top of the catchment, you'll, you have nice natural vegetation, part of the Wombat State Forest. And then as you move through, and and um, what, what you find is that um, the is that animals and wildlife up there are quite healthy. There's there's um, they're actually in fairly good um, shape in terms of health. But as you move down through the, through the catchment, you start to enter um, agricultural areas, and then you start getting into what's what, what is going to be an ever increasing urban um, urban land use down in the lowlands and especially in this in the skeleton and coal creek catchment where urbanization is, is is happening at a very fast pace but the take-home message is that um, pollution levels will will increase as urbanization increases now I suppose I will emphasise in this talk in industrial pollution because that's the that's the 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 land use act activity that seems to have the biggest um, impact on our waterways. And you can see here in these photos just you know some of the the issues that some of these industrial areas have. And it's not it's not all um, it's not I think it's being generated out of mainly a lack of awareness of, about what's going on, poor business practices and or deliberate actions by business owners to cut, to cut corners and reduce um, costs. So looking at this, this is a bit of modelling we did back in 2017. And what we wanted to look at here is the relative influence of all these 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 land use act, activities on pollution. So what we did, we looked at 100 wetlands ac across Melbourne, and we looked at the different land use um, in each of these catchments. And as you can see in in this in this uh, in this graph that as uh, that the the influence of industrial areas uh, is quite high so basically as industrial areas go up so does zinc copper lead oil nickel chromium concentrations and what we found through the modeling was around about only 10 percent of a catchment needs to have industrial area <clears throat> um, and then you'll you'll see a quite a, a sudden shift in how much pollution enters the the natural environment. So moving on to... Sorry, Dave, uh, just to, to interrupt, we got a, a question about those previous graphs. What does age right. represent in those? Ah, so that is age of, of wetland. So how long has that, has the, the wetland been a wetland? So obviously as a wetland um, gets older it will accumulate more pollution as it's entering the the wetland so it, it's an important factor that, that um, in the older areas of Melbourne where wetlands have been around for a while um, they do accumulate um, pollutants whereas younger um, wetlands in the suburbs in residential areas um, being built through through the stormwater management are a lot younger and they haven't had the the the, the opportunity to to accumulate as many pollutants so yeah great thank you, great, thank you. Yeah. so moving on to sediment so sediment in waterways is a is 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 a very critical part of of any waterway they 
it provides habitat, sources of food. It does a lot of the nutrient cycling that happens in aquatic ecosystems. And it does a lot of the mi microbial decomposition. So a healthy sediment would normally equal a, a very healthy waterway. Because what we find is that the aquatic life that lives in the waterways tend to have a really, they tend to interact a lot with the sediment moving in and out, in and out. And so they actually feed in, in the sediment. They'll actually um, use it as a habitat. And so they'll, they'll they, so insects will use sediments quite a lot in their uh, loss, in their loss cycle. So what we did, we thought we would have a look at the quality of the sediment in both the Werribee River and, and Skeleton Creek. Um, we collected surface sediment and then we had them analyse for a range of these common pollutants that we find in, in urban areas and, and the, the, they are the heavy metals and hydrocarbons. At the end, we developed a, a sediment pollution index that we've had that that we have been developing for quite a while uh, to easily look at whether a concentration is high or low, and it's easy for other people to interpret um, these results. So what we found, and it's not unexpected, but sediment quality varied throughout the catchment. And it also varied throughout the uh, two the two years of sampling. Heavy metal and oil was found uh, to be at extreme levels at several sites, but these these again were associated with some of those more heavily urban and industrial areas. But as these sites we found that would probably pose an extreme risk to any of the the local wildlife living in the sediment at these sites. Uh, sites associated with agriculture air, um, activities further, further south in the catchment, they posed less, less of a risk and we found that they were quite um, you know, low in these con contaminants. So you can see here quickly, I just, I'm going to show a couple of the sediment pollution profiles and you can see here at in the Werby River at Kayla K Road, Cliss, which is just below the Werby Mansion and Zoo, um, you can see that the pollution levels there are quite low. There's nothing really getting to moderate or high. But as we enter into um, an industrial area, we can see that all of a sudden you see you, you see spikes in number of um, of these of these pollutants and it's quite it's quite um, striking to see how how just how different some of these um, these sediments could can be um, so you can see the difference between industrial and more parkland type um, uh, sediments uh, got so, a couple more questions about those graphs yeah. Steve um, yeah. so just uh, TPH, what is that the acronym for? Oh, yeah, that's all the, the oils. So all the total petroleum hydrocarbons. So they're Excellent. all your, yeah, all your sort of petrol through to light, light, um, light oils. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and did you use the ANSEC figures for um, establishing low, medium and high for your concentrations? Yes. Yes, we did. So we used the um, the the low and high ANZAC guidelines as our yes, yep. Which right, are now you. in the yeah, and these are all now in the state environmental protection policies. So as of two thousand and eighteen, the EPA now recognise uh, the ANZAC guidelines as a as a um, in their state environmental protection policies. So that's quite interesting. So uh, yeah, moving on to how you would look at stormwater pollution profiles. So uh, we sampled a lot of these 
the the stormwater across the catchment about uh, fifteen odd odd catchments in the in the total catchment, um, and we, again we looked at this at several of these common pollutants. We use specialised samplers to do this, and I'll talk a bit about that uh, soon. But basically, when a high risk drain was identified. Um, then we would pass this information on to the authorities for further investigation where maybe an education and enforcement program might be set up and I will actually talk about one of these um, later in the talk. So we don't just go in there and take a grab sample from stormwater, we actually use um, samplers to do this. Um, the trouble with just taking a, a grab sample is that pulse events or pulse pollution events don't just happen all the time or at you know you, you cannot pick when a pulse pollution event is going to happen it could happen any time so to characterize the the water quality using grab sampling where you just go in and grab a bit of water you'd have to take lots and lots of samples which can be that which can be very ex expensive very quickly. Not only that, but a lot of the pollutants that we've been talking about here today are not readily de detected in water, but they attach to particles in the uh, water. So this is where having whether water is turbid or not turbid becomes quite important. And even if you want to set up an auto sampling um, operation where you put one of these machines um, in to actually take a grab sample every hour, again, you need power and it becomes quite expensive. However, so what we did, we developed um, what's what we call uh, storm scouts. And so basically what we do is we we use these um, these samplers. We actually fill them with a special media um, that is that has been developed to 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 concentrate a lot of these pollutants in. And then what we'll do is we'll put these these samplers out into the the stormwater drain, and where we will leave them there for one to two weeks, depending on what we're doing. And then what what we'll, what we'll do is we'll go, so we'll put them out and then we'll go back in two weeks, collect them, have the media analysed. And what we're able to do is basically capture 24 seven, any, any of these pulse pollution events, we'll actually go through the sampler media and um, you'll, you'll actually capture it. Um, they're very cost effective, you, you don't have to have power. And it, what this does is allows us to put multiple samplers out in the catchment at the one time. Uh, so you, you, you're not gonna be able to know when these pulse pollution events happen, but you'll know if it's happened. And just a, just a, a graph showing how it sort of works. So what we're looking for at the end is a time weighted average um, of pollution that would be in the sampler. Um, this would this would compare uh, to collecting a whole lot of grab samples, like in the in the blue line. What we're doing is we're actually just just looking at what's what at a time weighted average over that week or two weeks. So you'll pick up these pulse pollution events. You just won't know when. So looking at the results, so we looked at, again, pollution levels varied throughout the catchment. Um, there was high levels of pollution following a very similar pattern to the sediment pollution. Obviously, this is, this is not unexpected. A lot of the stormwater is the main sort of input and the main issue um, for sediment pollution, and again, we found that urban industrial areas had the highest levels. It's not unexpected, but you, you can see here how you get this urban trend. I'm just going to try and uh, make the point. You can see this sort of where 
as soon as, you, soon as you get into this really um, urban urban area here, through here, you can see how the, the profiles just begin to increase quite a bit um, until you get down to here, W7, and that's the, the, the hotspot. That's the, the area which I'm going to talk about next, but you can see this multi-industrial area, which, which we caught down here, this one had the highest pollution levels of all the sites. So what we did, we decided to do a, a hotspot investigation in here using the same samplers. We then targeted this area and did a lot more of intensive sampling in this industrial area. So we, we, we put out 10, 10 um, we chose 10 stormwater drains and profile them um, for these pollutants. Heavy metals and hydrocarbons. Um, and this is the area here, which came out as the, the hotspot for the, this area. This H4 had very high levels of everything. It was quite high. Um, so what we did, we teamed up with the EPA for the, the Opal program Michelle Walker, um, was, who was part of the Opal program back then, and Teresa McIntosh, who's part of the Werribee River Association, went out and went along and door knocked on all these businesses in the area, gave them a a letter showing that we'd done all this all this sampling, we'd we'd, we'd come back with these results, and that and then Michelle let them 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 know that we would be going going and doing our sampling again in six months and if things weren't weren't lower if things hadn't changed then the EPA would be doing formal inspections um, of these businesses the response from the business owners was very positive overall many of the business owners indicated they would they would try to do better they didn't understand there's a lack of understanding and that now that they were told they would actually be a lot more inclined to look at what they were doing and to improve their their practices um so we wanted to see how true this was and it was it was very su successful um after six months after going back after six months we did the same profiling exactly the same spots and what we found was stormwater pollution significantly decreased after the education program this is not new we found we've, we've been looking at this for a long time and education seems to be a critical factor in reducing long-term stormwater pollution being able to talk and and um, educate business owners in these high risk areas seems to have a really big positive um, impact on our on our stormwater quality. <clears throat> so if you look at here, you can I'll just show you one of the pollution fingerprints that that we took. So in in 2018, which is here, this is one of the this was the, the the very bad site that we're talking about had huge amounts of, of zinc very high levels of um nickel lead everything with was, was really high when we went back in 2019 six months we saw everything had dropped down to very low low levels zinc had had just had just crashed there was just nothing there anymore um Still had slight levels of TBH and, and nickel, but overall, this is a really good result. What we did find was pollution did increase at one site, but as you can see here, while we were out monitoring, we actually saw a pollution event in progress, and which we do 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 link to this hot this H5 site here. Though actually, you know, there's a massive pollution event happening at the time when we were out there um, when we we're out there doing our work so we actually 
um, notified Michelle at the EPA and she took enforcement action against this business and as far as I know there was a pollution abatement notice issued for, for this company to to stop what they were doing and to fix the um, the problem but you can see how easy it is for these pollutants just to get in into the system Dave might just yeah, um, Dave, interrupt yeah, with a couple uh, of questions yeah sure uh, so directly related, 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 related to that lot uh, will you be going uh, back and checking going if back it has been sustained, sustained in the longer term look we, we, we would we would love to um, obviously you know this is this would be a ideal situation that you'd actually have funding to um, go back and really look at this over one year two years you know and to make sure and to actually keep up that education if required or enforcement so we would love to we're not at the moment we're not funded to do any more of this work at the moment but i know john faster and um is very keen to get more funding i, I know he's very uh, he's very adamant that we will we will be able to find more funding to to maybe keep some of this going but yeah we'll have to wait and see i suppose yeah uh, we've also got a question, uh, we've why not just sample sediments sample rather than sediment. um, the, the flow samples you've been taking? Flow samples you've been taking? Yeah, so obviously you can, you can just take sediment and that will tell you there, there's an issue. What we've, what we've found is that um, when you can put these samplers out into the, the, the stormwater, you can, you can actually within a couple of weeks identify areas that are priority for further investigation and areas that aren't so if you're going to go in and do a massive catchment like say Dandenong south or the hume the hume industrial areas it would just be too big a job to investigate the 10,000 businesses that are in these areas but if you can if you can narrow your investigation area down to 20, 30 businesses, all of a sudden you open up the opportunity to, 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 to very quickly respond and identify problem businesses. And I'll make a point that, that, that a lot of the time in 5,000 businesses that are, are, are out there, there might only be 10 that are doing the wrong thing or is actually doing most of the damage. So it's not the, we, we don't have to look at all 5,000 businesses, but what we do wanna do is understand which businesses are causing it so we can actually go and take action on the ground. So, yeah. Uh, and I might just uh, ask one last question before we can get back to the yep. presentation. Um, yep. Could you just give the definition of a pulse pollution event? Uh, so is that something other than rainfall, for example, dumping waste? Yeah. Well, I suppose the most um, I suppose the most easy example would be what's happened down in St in Stony Creek, maybe last year or, or the year before with that f fire. Now that's a really big pulse pollution event. That was when all the the fire that that was down in that area, um, that industrial f fire. With all that water that that was tipped on that fire that got into the creek, carried all those industrial contaminants into the creek and caused a, a very big pulse pollution event, which is still having impacts now. And I know EPA and Melbourne Water are working hard to um, to fix it, but that's a bigger big event. Um, I suppose what we what we're targeting is maybe someone who's tipped. Uh, a paint, an old paint tin filled with old paint straight down the uh, straight down the, the uh, drain and it's that pulse event. So they might tip oils or paints or petrol or um, they might, yeah, so they're the, they're the ones, they're the pulse events that are going to be picked up. Uh, they're the ones that, that we target. Um, but you can see they, they do have a scale. So you might have a small one which might be just a, a five litre tin of petrol right up to a fire that happened up in Tot Tottenham, 
which would be a major pulse pollution event. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. We'll um we'll get to some of those other questions later on. Cheers. Yep. Yeah, sure. So mo moving on, I suppose um the other aspect was to actually look at the ecological health of the creek and Teresa McIntosh was um was mainly responsible for this work. So thanks, Teresa. She did a great job um, uh, in doing the biological monitoring uh, for this project. Um, but we we used we to do this to actually understand the direct impacts on the ecology of the the waterway. So invertebrates are great indicators. Um, in they they they're great at 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 telling us the ability for ecosystems to support other animals such as fish and platypus. They're very abundant and they're widespread. So in an area like the, the Werribee catchment, the composition is not going to change too much as long as there's no other mitigate, mitigating instances. So you can compare across your different sites. They, they have a range of sensitivities to pollution, so some might be very sensitive, they'll die out very fast, and others might be more tolerant and they'll be able to hang around a lot longer. So they're very good also at responding to environmental changes very, very rapidly. So here's just an, an example of some of the, the macro invertebrates that we looked at in this project, and these are some of the sensitive animals such as stoneflies, caddisflies and mayflies. Again, these all have a, a range of sensitivities, these groups, but in general, they're fairly sensitive. Whereas then you go to your more tolerant animals, such as midge larvae, snails, water boatmen and worms. So the more tolerant animals you get and the less sensitive animals will obviously tell you that there's um, something going on. And if there's nothing out there, then that's that's bad. That's even worse. So we we did all the so we, we actually did the macro invertebrate surveys where we collected this the the sediment. Um, we used a number of indexes developed over the last thirty years, um, such as Signal and number of fam fam families to give us an idea of how healthy these these systems are. And if you take a look at this map here, I won't go into it too much, but you'll be able to see quite quickly the 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 red the red dots is where it failed the state environmental protection policy guidelines, and in the green it's where it passed the state environmental protection policy. So not not a good result, both in or well, this is only two two out of I think six um, sampling events that were d done over the over the um, the course of the project but you'll see I don't think things change too much the macro invertebrate communities throughout these urban areas suffered have suffered quite a, quite a lot um, so, and a bit of my old research I suppose and a bit of this these the, the things we did back at the, the uni. Um, we, we, we used um, invertebrates a lot to actually identify chemicals of cons concern. Um, we were able to do either sediment ecotoxicology or even do experiments out in the field where you where you would put microcosms out um, and you would actually um, let you, so say these buckets up in the uh, left-hand corner in this wetland, we filled them with different sediments from different uh, sites. We'd let the invertebrates um, colonise the sediment. We'd put then after a month, we'd put these these nets over them, and then we would capture all the the adults as they emerged. And then what we were able to do then is directly assess the impact of um, of sediments on on how on on the emergence of of insects. So this is they're a very good tool, I suppose, as well. 
So the ecological impacts of pollutants, I've just got, I sort of, I've done up a bit of a schematic on the, uh, the, the, the right here, showing some of the pollutants of interest throughout the catchment. But we know that platypus and fish populations can be both directly and indirectly impacted by pollutants. And that's because there's a big food, food, food web going on out there. Um, if you if you lose part of your ecosystem, then it's going to have flow on effects as you go up the um, up the food web chain. Um, platypus, fish, birds, they all have um, the pollutants all have impacts on, on all the, these animals. Um, and it's just that the macro invertebrates seem to be, they seem to have the biggest, you know, you, you can actually directly witness what's going on, whereas the other ones with fish and say platypus, they're more subtle. Although if you ask John Foster, who I know is here today, he'll say that the urbanization and you know the impacts of, of this is, is definitely having a big impact on the platypus populations in the Werribee catchment. <clears throat> so moving on to education and awareness. Um, a really big part of the project and mainly headed up by Teresa McIntosh and John Forrester uh, was the community training in biological assessments. So members, so we, we I say we, because we got involved as well, but, but um, we went out and um, trained com com community members on how to do macroinvertebrate surveys. We, we we taught volunteers how to do insect identification and taught them a lot about the general information required to understand um, catchment assessments. Uh, so that was a heap of fun. I know there's quite a lot of volunteers over the over the two two years, and um, so it was it was very very good to see the um, the res response. This was also taken into school education and awareness programs. Um, headed up this, but we got involved at the end. Um, was taking what we what we what we're doing and introducing the um, these programs to to schools hopefully will set us up for a a, a um a, i suppose a, a, the next generation to have a lot more awareness about what's going on out there and i think we all understand that how important that is um grabbing on and getting kids involved early is is um is vital we also use uh, we also looked at reducing litter impacts um we actually set our drone up into the into to the sky across the catchment and looked at how we could identify litter hotspots um we, the idea was then to feed that information back onto community collection days. So actually to target um, com community collection days and on-ground surveys um, where, the, where you would get the biggest bang for buck, I suppose. So I think that was quite successful. Uh, we're, we're still working through those results, but yeah, it was it was very good. So getting on to solutions, um, I suppose I've just got a, a bit of a slide here. I don't want everyone to read everything on it, but these are some of the, the ways that businesses can improve their practices. And I'll leave that up there. I mean, obviously, uh, this, will, this, this uh, talk will be on the Melbourne Water website. So maybe go back and have a look at some of this. Um, but again, capturing waste using spill kits as soon as there's a spill get you know clean it up use 
um, drums with our lids. It's very simple, but uh, you, you'd be surprised how many drums that are storing toxicants just don't have have lids. Um, washing vehicles away from from from, from storm water. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and I suppose this one here. I suppose what we want to do is. I suppose one of the things that I'm really passionate about is um, let's reduce our reliance on expensive stormwater management and stop pollution at its source. I think the emphasis has been on managing pollution for a long time. We put in, in the, in, the in engineering that goes into building wetlands and, and swales and all sorts of stuff is fantastic. And I think they offer a, a great solution um, to the, the, the impact of pollution, but we have to actually stop it. If we don't stop it, this is just gonna be an, an endless um, cycle of generating pollution, managing pollution, and then you just keep going around in circles. And I think we, we as a society can do our, our own bit um, to stop pollutants from entering waterways. Um, and there's a bit of a diagram there, um, a bit of a, an illustration there. And again, please go back and, 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 and have a look. I suppose what we're doing now from, a, from our own point of view, and this has come out in a lot of this is what we're trying to do now is do real-time pollution monitoring. And we've just set up a, a project with the first friends of Dandong Creek, um, where we've actually put four sensors in the, in the creek. And in about a week or maybe soon, we're, we're, we're still working through, but we're gonna make that online for everyone to see. And this is basically giving you real-time water quality information, which will, which will go a long way to identifying pollution events as it's happening. Um, so yeah, that's a project with uh, the first friends of Dandenong Creek. <clears throat> so we, we started off with uh, four or five partners and over the last two years, that's um, through a lot of work through Teresa, um, especially had, and, and, and John, um, that that these sort of partnerships have now grown to include lots of different um, entities, such as Water Watch, River Detectives, Yarra River Keeper, EPA, schools across the district, and even Deakin Uni. Um, so yeah, that that's it for today. Um, if you want, yeah, happy happy to take questions now. But I hope you enjoyed the talk. Excellent. Thanks very much Excellent. for that, Dave. Um, we have a lot of questions that have come through, so <laughs> I'll start. Um, I'll start working through some of the ones that we uh, we didn't get to a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, but yes, if people have further questions, just keep typing them. We will get to them eventually. Yeah, uh, as long as you've got the time available for us, Dave. Yeah, I might as well just uh, yeah, I'll put myself on on live. <laughs> and, Excellent. Uh, uh, okay, so. Uh, the next question we got up is a bit of an expansion on the age question uh, in terms of the wetlands uh, storing pollutants. Uh, so are those high pollution level results with older wetlands about stored pollutants or released from the wetlands and measured downstream? No, those, um, those modeling, that modeling data was all generated from wetlands. So nothing downstream, just the end wetland where these, where all the stormwater would, um, and all of the actual catchment water would end up as as part of the the ongoing waterway you know management. A lot of a lot of catchments now have wetlands that are there to intercept these pollutants. Um, so yeah, all wetland data. Thanks. Um, what kind of media was put in the sampler? It's a very special media no no um <laughs> basically no it's basically a, what we've done over the past uh quite a few years is is look at a whole range of different medias um and we've probably taken a bit 
a few you know, like there's probably uh, a lot of organic um, material. I don't have it off the top of my head the, the exact composition, um, but it's basically been designed to accumulate um, these types of um, hydrophobic pollutants such as heavy metals and hydrocarbons. Not so good at the, at the hydrophilic ones, such as the ones that are going to stay in the uh, water and not bind to organic material. So it's been really designed um, to capture those hydrophobic or or water-hating pollutants. Yeah. Um, and are you happy to talk about the cost of those Storm Scout units and the analysis, or is that uh, a question perhaps better um, through a direct contact with you? Oh, well, look, I mean, no, I mean, yeah, it depends on the project, but, you know, they start off at about only around about $20, $20 a sampler. Um, and the analysis can go up as high as you want. You know, you can, you can analyse pesticides with these samplers, but that becomes very expensive. Hydrocarbons and metals aren't that expensive. Um, yeah. Um, so it, it's a it's a bit of a how how long is a piece of of, of string, but you know you can set up um, hotspot investigations or pollution investigations for quite it's quite in it's quite um, cost effective in terms of other ways of sampling. Yeah. Do you know of any examples of locations that are highly urbanised and industrialised that don't have issues with stormwater pollution or have successfully um, reduced the pollutants ending up in the local waterways? So any other case studies aside from what you've achieved with this project? Well, yeah, actually, we did a, a project with our Knox Council um, last year. And it's I think, again, age might have a lot to do with it. And I think newer industrial areas are probably going to be better um, than older uh, older areas. This one, where we looked up in, I uh, can't remember the exact location, but it went in the 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 stormwater went into Menowing Creek, um, um, probably up near up up in Knox somewhere up up there. Um, but yeah, we did find that it, it was actually quite a good site, um, quite a good industrial area um it was probably more heavily to that more commercial so there was quite a few packing companies and probably ones with that weren't weren't generating a lot of the uh, waste that we see from mechanics or electro platers or um yeah so it does it does you know again industrial areas aren't just industrial areas there there is a big there is a big variation in what an industrial area is. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, for the scout samplers, along with contaminant mass, were you also able to measure the volume of stormwater that had flowed through them in order to calculate contaminant concentration? So no, that was not part of the this that that, that was not part of this program. We have done that in the past. Um, so measuring f f um, f measuring flow at 15 sites would have cost a lot. Um, there are all, there are quite you know you, you can get cost effective ways to measure f flow, but what we really wanted to do was pick up those concentrations. We weren't particularly interested in the uh, the uh, loads, and that's what you can do if you measure flow. You can actually start to get pollution loading on the that that is actually happening we were more interested in just the concentrations because we see that's going to tell us more about a hotspot than um how much load it's yeah so there's a difference between concentration and and load and we were more interested in concentration in regards to like your auditing of the businesses in the industrial area, did you develop a bit of a spidey sense of likely point sources um, based on like external appearances of the individual businesses, whether they were tidy or they were messy, or if there was differences between the types of business, like if it was car repair versus manufacturing, and 
could that be the potential for building up a bit of a risk profile based on those kind of business types? No, that's, that's an excellent question. And, and yes, it's, I mean, when we go around and I've been traveling around industrial areas for going on eight years now, and you can definitely see like that photo I showed earlier, you know, that would be a, that one with all the, um, the drums of, of oil and drums of toxic, toxicants just sitting there, probably leaking. Um, you can get a feel for, you know, straight away whether this is going to be a pollution hotspot. Um, there's been times when, when we just pick, when we just open up a pit, pit lid and that's it. That's all we have to do. Open up a pit lid. We don't have to put any samples down. We don't even have to c collect any water. We, well, we know as soon as we've opened up that, that pit lid that this is a, this is a a pollution hotspot. It can be that's that simple. Um, anything that you can see, like a colour, like paints or other colourful pollutants, you can actually just keep opening up the drains further up in the catchment till the paints or that that colour disappears. So you know it has to be here. Um, so yeah, colourful pollutants um, can actually be be tracked back to a business quite fast. Um, you don't even have to yeah, collect a, a sample. <clears throat> uh, there's there's an interesting conversation that was taking in chat about um, the differences between um, native trees and deciduous trees and uh, the nutrient loads associated with the, the leaf dumps that happen in autumn. Um, did you pick up any um, kind of patterns or seasonal patterns as a result of whether it was, you know, um, the vegetation that was in the area or something else? Well, we didn't look at nutrients um, in this project. Um, so I couldn't t tell you whether the nutrient impacts of um, different tree species was having an impact. Um, I guess, yes, I think with the, I think you could, you, with the, the more native trees, you might get more tannins and more of these um, oily substances, but um, we weren't actually picking that up in the, um, in the, the actual drains themselves. Um, so, so I probably can't answer that any better at this point but yeah thank you um there's a question mm. about ricali and they seem to hang on longer in more urban environments and uh if there's any toxicant studies that are known in this species um did you see any other impacts in terms of other uh wildlife uh in terms of like the impacts associated with the, the results that you were finding um i guess further than the background vertebrates that you were sampling um well not not directly. I suppose we didn't sort of survey any other animals with this project except for the invertebrates. Um, obviously, you, know, you, you, you can you can have anecdotal evidence through fog, 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 fog noises, and um, other things, and just the amount of bird bird life at a at a site, but no real concrete data there that we could probably um, comment any further on but it, yeah i think if you go out to these sites and you sit there long enough and you and you go to d different areas in the catchment you'll be able to see major differences in what's appearing what's what's not there and i think that's the, the easiest way to explain it it's just getting out there and actually you know looking for birds and looking for, for frogs or you know um <clears throat> Just you know, and finding you know, yeah, we didn't we didn't actually collect any of that information direct, direct, directly. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what parameters can be measured in real time with the auto samplers you were using? Yeah, so we're building up a um, we're building up a, a a range of parameters now. The ones we're using with the first friends of Dan on Creek are. Are the um, the the main water quality parameters such as pH, EC, um, ORP, um, 
dissolved oxygen levels in the uh, water temperature um, and there's another where, where we're doing another project with EPA we've do, we're doing an R&D project with, with them where we're trialling more um, um, I suppose um, uh, looking at pollutants like um, copper and ammonia and and these and you, you, and you can do nitrates and nitrites but you're getting into very um, high level of um, sensors there so I suppose we yeah so there's a whole range of different things you can measure it just depends on the application and what you want to do yeah great um, some great comments about um uh, the real-time monitoring uh, through the website that you've got. Um, will it be posted through your Buy2 lab? Um, and is it going to be available for other areas beyond Dandenong Creek and Werribee River? Um, well, it's not available in the Werribee River, um, so we haven't done any of that. We've we would like to. We we do have an application in um, to do that with a through the uh, with the Werribee River Association as part of an, another project. But at the moment, the first friends of Daniel Creek. That's the um, the one that we've mainly been working on at the the at the uh, moment. Um, <clears throat> so. It will be available uh, through a, not through our website directly. Uh, it'll be through a, a online portal that we'll set up through the first Friends of Dandenong Creek. Uh, we're, just, we're just really um, g g getting the, that uh, ready to, um, to put out there. So we're working with the first Friends of Dandenong Creek um, committee at the moment to make sure it's all, um, up and running and all the different um, parameters are, are, are ready um, and it will it will be publicly available once it goes up and maybe I might even put that a link subject to approval by FFDC up on the Melbourne Water website under this talk maybe we'll just have to wait and see <laughs> but yeah it's definitely going to be available to the community and you know, hopefully we, we, we get more of these these projects and that we can put more more out there yeah uh, and for those that are asking for copies of the presentation we have been recording this uh, and we'll be putting it up online uh, once we've gone through and edited um, this and a couple of the other presentations as well so hopefully quite soon keep crossing our fingers to get that up there but um yes you'll be able to access this uh later on online um, and we got a question about uh, does ammonia present as a stormwater pollutant or problem in wetlands and creeks? So you weren't uh, tracking for those kind of nutrients, but do you have any um, perspective on that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, look, that, that uh, ammonia is a is definitely a big pollutant of, of interest of concern. Um, it is wide, wide, widespread and is a um, you know and is a very important pollutant um so yeah we'd love to I mean obviously we we um we are limited by what we can do sometimes we would love to, to, to do everything um but obviously a lot of these things cost more and um and just we have to then prioritize what we what we um think are the most important areas um but yeah definitely ammonia and and even um nutrients in general such as nitrogen and phosphorus that they're, they're all very important um pollutants and especially when it gets in the bay i, I know that's the, the the main the main reason by for melbourne water putting in so many wetlands has been to stop nutrients getting into the bay and that's because once you nutrient levels to go go up whether it's in the uh, river or in, in the bay you start getting algae and you start getting algal outbreaks and it becomes a very big big issue yeah 
Um, we're getting to our last question so far. Um, is the cost of correct disposal waste a major factor? And I guess that's, yeah, around those industrial areas, what might be some of the bigger drivers for, for those pollutants coming out? Yeah, look, I think, I think it is. I think, um, I think a lot of smaller businesses um, do have, um, you know, they, they would love to do the right thing, but a lot of times, you know, it is, it probably could be cost prohibitive. Um, I think a lot of the smaller businesses as well, they're not, um, they're not managed like bigger businesses are through trade waste agreements and stuff like that through the local waterway or water um, companies and EPA. So when you have a trade waste agreement, you're able to put stuff down to sewer um, and you, you've got an agreement to put X amount of stuff down to sewer. A smaller business just that doesn't really apply. So a small electric plating business or mechanical business, um, they fall through those gaps. Uh, so they have to then call in an expert um, disposal um, company to take it away. And we do know that that does cost a lot. Uh, so maybe I think that that is a, a factor that should be looked at. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. And uh, one last question that I can see, just a question about um, if people can get the PowerPoint presentation separately from the recording. So we can chat about that, Dave, in terms of if you're happy to share that with everyone and we can pop that up onto the, the web page once we've um, put the recording up and the other resources in terms of other links might be there as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, th thanks very much for your time today, uh, Dave. It was an excellent presentation. Lots of discussion around that. And um, thank you very much for everyone that has joined us today to watch the presentation. Uh, so we've got a great audience that have come across uh, all across Melbourne. We've got some interstate people that have joined us and a couple of international viewers as well, which is fantastic. So uh, hello to those that have joined us from Canada today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.